All right, I think that's that's everyone that's supposed to be here so far. So uh, well, welcome back. Uh, it's nice to see everyone for the third day. Um, so I'm just gonna do a, a brief overview and introduction and then Phil's gonna peek, peek over uh, most of the day uh, with intermittent breakout rooms, which we tested yesterday. So the, the goal of today is to ha have everyone be able to kind of run their full own minion session in the meta cell cloud. Um, and the day will be structured such that we're all gonna be in the main room and Phil's gonna walk us through a portion of the steps of minion. And then we all get to jump out into small breakout rooms where you'll get to run that portion um, in your own Jupyter notebook with uh, uh, a TA in your room that can ask, you could ask and uh, get all your questions answered. And those breakout rooms are going to be, you know, around 10 or 15 minute chunks where you get to run your own um, code and ask questions. And then we all will jump back out to the breakout room and walk through the next session um, with Phil. I think everyone was probably here yesterday and, and knows Phil, but Phil is a grad student in Denise Kai's lab and really developed uh, Minion from all the inspiration that came before Minion and these other open source pipelines, Hyman and CNMF and uh, MinPipe. So I think with that, uh, I'll throw it over to Phil. We have an hour, a little bit more of kind of the first few steps that Phil's going to run us through and then we get to um, start running our own code. All right, go ahead, Phil. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, hey, everyone. Again, welcome. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, uh, today I'm gonna try to walk you through uh, the pipeline of Minion and you'll be able to run your own uh, uh, with, uh, with the help of from TA. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can start. All right, can everyone see my screen? Good, okay, I assume so. Um, so you guys have, uh, we made sure everyone can log in to the Metasol Cloud yesterday, right? So uh, everyone should be able to see uh, something similar to my screen, uh, this Jupyter uh, notebook interface. Uh, having, I have a, a few more little more file here, but the most important folder is Minion Workshop. Um, so if everyone can sort of log onto the cloud and go into this folder, there is a notebook called Pipeline. Uh, we're just gonna click on that and we'll start um, with something here like this. Um, so while you know everyone's kind of logging in and getting stuff ready, uh, I'm gonna quickly say uh, sort of the goal of today. Um, I'm gonna, you know, Minion come with this notebook that has a lot of these kind of tags, uh, tips, little helps and, and uh, comments. So that's already there on the online and you can you know always download a notebook and read them. Uh, so I'm gonna try to focus on something else today uh, because we are doing an interactive session. I'm gonna try to uh, sort of show you how personally I would do this if I'm if I'm running media on my own data, uh, you know, I'm focus. I'm gonna focus more on how to use the visualization and maybe throw in some some of my personal tricks, you know, quality of life tricks, so everything can be easier. Um, so that's gonna be the focus today, and I think the 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 format or like the way we are gonna do this is trying to be as interactive as possible. Uh, I'm gonna walk through the notebook. Uh, on my screen so everyone can see that. At any point, if you think I'm going too fast or if you have a question, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. I think we make sure everyone can unmute themselves freely right now. Maybe you can even go ahead and give it a try right now. Um, so just feel free to ask any question, uh, interrupt at, at any point. And you know, if I'll try my best to answer the question, if we are limiting on time, or if you have a more specific problem that needs a TA's help, I'm gonna say, you know, please sort of hold this question and try to follow along uh, later, or either even just, you know, not really running it anymore, just watch me doing it. Uh, and you can sort of repeat what we have done in a breakout room with TA. Okay, so that's sort of, 
you, the main site uh, for today. Like you see say everything on my screen, I'm gonna say run this cell, this cell, and you're gonna do it on your own. You're gonna try to kind of follow that in the real time as much as possible. Uh, if you have question, ask it. If I couldn't answer your question, don't be discouraged. Just try to watch uh, my walkthrough uh, and follow it uh, and then run it later in the breakout room. Um, does that sounds good to everyone? Good. Okay, I'm gonna assume good. Um, so I think with that, we are sort of ready to get started. Uh, I, I like to, uh, okay, have, does anyone, have anyone now be able to reach what I've been seeing right now? Like a notebook and a, and a table of content on the left side. If you don't see it, please unmute yourself and say it out right now. Okay, I assume I will have this. Um, so this is the notebook. Uh, it's almost identical to the one you can get from GitHub. I'm gonna switch to the GitHub tab. Uh, this is the you know the mini and GitHub repo online. Uh, the notebook we are using today is almost identical to this pipeline notebook here on GitHub. Uh, you can get so again, it contains almost all the information you you need to refer to later. Uh, more importantly than this notebook is that Minion also have a have a designated documentation site. Uh, we can post a link later, maybe uh, one of the TA can help me post a link, but you can also reach that site uh, with, with a link in this notebook. Uh, it says Minion uh, read the doc set. If you click on that, uh, you, can, you can reach this site. Um, but basically it has uh, like, a, like a all the installation uh, guide, uh, the, the pipeline notebook, and more importantly, it has API reference of every single function Minion has. So whenever you sort of forget what each parameter mean, like uh, what do they do or what's the meaning of that, uh, this is the best source of reference. Like I, I, I personally use this myself, like spatial update. Uh, there are so many stuff in there. I, sometimes I don't remember how I name one parameter or stuff like that. I actually go back to this myself and, um, to remember, you know, how to set parameters. So just want to say um, for the stuff, like if you, whenever you get lost or like you forget uh, what each function do, this is the best source of help. Uh, and that's always available online for you. Um, so with that, let's go back to the notebook. Um, um, I already said you try to uh, go ahead and follow along. And then I'm gonna sort of introduce a little bit of the Jupyter interface, uh, cause you know, just so everyone on the same page. So, cause someone is more like a developing on the backend side, not really use this interface. Um, this is a notebook. Uh, you can scroll up and down in here. Uh, basically everything on top of here is like a markdown cell. They are just tags and pictures uh, to, you know, like they're human language, they, they are their comments uh, to, to tell you what's going on. And then you also have uh, something like a code cell here that's, that has this little shaded background. And in order to run a cell, um, you can either click this run button, or I think uh, the uh, shortcut for that is shift enter, uh, which will run and move to the next cell. Uh, so that's sort of the basic interface. Uh, of how to, you know, go to different uh, cells like block code blocks, I guess, and run them. So either click run or shift enter. Um, we also have a table of content here. Uh, I'm gonna sort of go uh, go through that later when we talk about uh, what's the schedule for today. Uh, the other thing I want to talk before that is. Uh, uh, if you can go to the top right corner of this interface, it's, it has a tiny thing says Minion, which is confusing. That is actually the name of the Jupyter kernel that's sort of uh, executing your code. So Jupyter have this concept of kernel. It's, it's constantly listening to your input and try to interpret your code and try to run them and show the result to you. That thing kind of hold all your uh, variable, hold everything for you in memory. <clears throat> 
So as long as that's alive, uh, all your kind of results will be available in memory. Uh, but that also determine what kind of package is available for you. Uh, so, you know, Python is built on top of a lot of uh, third party packages. So um, if you have trouble like importing anything, like loading any sort of package, uh, it's usually that you are uh, using a wrong kernel. So uh, right now I want to say, everyone, please make sure uh, that the this kernel thing here says minion because you know they can be wrong. Uh, if it's not saying minion, uh, you can go to this kernel drop down and there's a change kernel op uh, option. I think right now on the cloud there are only two available. Just make sure you choose minion here. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, how to restart a kernel, right? Like what if you mess something up and if your, your, your current session is all messed up and you want to start clean um, and clear everything. Uh, that's pretty easy. I usually go to kernel. There is a restart and clear output. Uh, I'm just gonna do that right now. It's gonna ask you to confirm. Go ahead and click the red button. And uh, now I have a fresh kernel without anything. Uh, and all my uh, all my output from my cells are also cleared. Um, so that's that. Um, oh, uh, the other thing is how do you tell whether something is still running? Uh, it's really hard to catch because this cell uh, usually fast. Uh, let me just try it. Uh, the way you tell is is you if you uh, is to pay attention to this little bracket here. It's empty right now. If I run it you'll see there will be a star for a few seconds. That's when the cell is running. One, two, three. So that's when it's running. When you become a number, it's finished, it's done. So that's sort of how you tell whether something's still running. Apparently, if something's still running, don't kind of interrupt it without a good reason. Uh, just let it finish. Um, so that's a little tip for the interface. Um, and with that, I'm gonna sort of talk about the schedule for today. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling uh, in the wrong direction. Okay, so if you scroll up a tiny bit, you see this uh, workflow pipeline picture that you already saw several times. Um, uh, you know, Minion is divided into this, a few different state, basic stages, like pre-processing, motion correction, initialization step, then CMF update. So this sort, sort of also correspond to the table of content uh, on the left side. Uh, you can see the yellow one is where I'm at, currently at right now. Oh, sorry, not yellow one. Uh, yes, no, yellow one. Um, you know, preface, that's just the, the notebook for this. Um, we're gonna go through setting up and pre-processing in one session. So um, uh, like a few minutes later, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you how to set up and how to finish the pre-processing step. So that's kind of the one, two, three here. And then after that, we'll have a breakout room. So that's how you know, like you sort of have an idea of how far away you are from uh, a breakout room in case you need to uh, hold a question. And then we're gonna do motion correction, which is gonna be really quick. Uh, it will probably take maybe less than half an hour. And then after that, we have a breakout room just to make sure you run the motion correction properly. And then we'll have a lunch break. Uh, and I'm aiming for, for that around 1.30. So you can sort of plan ahead. Uh, so around 1.30, we'll already be finished uh, uh, kind of pre-processing and motion creating our video and you know we can take a break and grab a lunch and then in the afternoon we're gonna start around two o'clock eastern time uh, we're gonna start uh, from initialization you know generate all these seats and then another breakout after initialization to make sure you know everyone's seats is looking correctly and then the final kind of uh we, the final section, or we're gonna power through CMF algorithm, which is uh, a lot of stuff is happening. But uh, you know, that's the last part. We'll have we'll probably have a breakout in the middle of CMF somewhere. So you know, to, just to keep everything relatively short, and you can interact with TA in case you have problems. And then we'll finish uh, around four, I think, today. And then uh, for whoever that already upload their own data to MetaCell stick you can feel free to stick along uh after four everyone will be available here in the zoom 
uh, to kind of help you run through your own uh, your own data and answer any question you have. Um, so that's sort of the schedule for today. Um, um, if there's no question, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna kick off by you know setting stuff up. Um, this part will be sort of boring and it will now have a lot of interactive component. Uh, so just bear with me. Uh, but I, I, I do want to say that this part, or despite it's very boring, it is one of the most uh, frequent place where people get stuck because you know it, it's just loading package and setting parameters. But sometimes that can be confusing, especially for someone not familiar with you know Python or the notebook. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Uh, make sure you either scroll or click on the table content to get to this place that called setting up. Uh, I guess I already run the first cell uh, while we're talking. Um, this is not really uh, exciting at all. You just run it because it's just importing a bunch of stuff. Uh, go ahead and run it. Um, did I hear anything or does anyone have a question? Okay. Everyone go ahead and run it and then move on to 2.2, um, which is basically the, the, the master block of setting a bunch of parameters. Um, so this is the place where you set every single parameter that Minion is going to use uh, for later step. Uh, apparently, most of them only make sense when I'm actually going to talk about the algorithm in the in a step. So I'm going to skip most of them for now. Um, the only thing I want to sort of talk about before we uh, start, or like it's the only thing that you want to change right here, is um, a few passes. So. Uh, you see in the beginning there's a minion pass which sort of tell you tell the program where to find minion you don't normally you don't need to worry about that especially if you're installing from counter forge you don't need to worry about that at all you can even uh, i'm gonna say don't delete that but you don't have to worry about that uh it's only uh kind of useful if you are doing like a git installation or if you're trying to develop minion um so for today we don't have to worry about that just leave it alone the pass is probably the, the most important thing you want to set to begin with because it's, that's where the minion, uh, that's where minion is going to look for your data, your videos. So you can see that right now it's set to the folder called demo movies. Uh, if you, you know, want to explore a little bit, it's actually referring to uh, these demo movies in the same folder. And if you click in that, you know, you have your typical. Uh, miniscope recording that's kind of chunk into different uh, videos. Um, so that's uh, how you specify the input data to Minion. Uh, Minion DS pass is where Minion is going to put the output, uh, put its output, the final output. Um, it's a little bit more convoluted than a straight pass because you know usually we want to put stuff in the same folder as your input. So basically this is saying put it in the same place as D pass, but you know, have a, a independent folder called media output. Uh, so we don't, we don't need to change that for today, but you know, that's something potentially you want to change and be definitely be aware of when you're actually running your own stuff. Um, the last thing is intermediate pass. This is where media store all the intermediate result uh, during process. If you remember, media try to do a computation directly from hard drive to hard drive. So there's going to be a lot of intermediate stuff writing, uh, being written to the hard drive. And uh, one thing you want to usually make sure is that uh, you want to point this to a place where it's backed by an SSD. So you want the rewrite speed to be as fast as possible for this pass. And apparently you want to make sure you have enough free space uh, for this, because sometimes the variable can be really large. Uh, again, we don't have to change out that today. But these are the things you should be aware of, you know, when you are running Minion. Uh, so go ahead, just run this. Nothing needs to be changed for now. Um, if you click run, like Shift Enter, it will kind of automatically jump to the next part for you. Uh, this is the part where we import a bunch of function from Minion. Again, it's very boring. You just need to run it. The only thing to be aware of is that if you see any sort of error here. Um, you know, if 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 the if the function couldn't find anything, uh, 
I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to put in some random function that minion doesn't have at all. Uh, you're going to have an import arrow. Whenever you get this, it means there's something wrong with kernel or something wrong with installation. So uh, that's how you know, uh, you know, like what's 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 going on. Like if you're hitting anything in this code block, that means you need to go back and see uh, what, what's going on, like how is minion installed and where's the path set, stuff like that. So go ahead and run it. You shouldn't hit any arrow. Uh, uh, yes. Can I ask something quickly? Um, Go ahead. How much space would uh, would we need on the hard disk approximately? Because I mean, the the memory demand is quite high. For example, in Kaiman, mm -hmm. do we need the same, like hundred twenty gigabyte or something, or sixty gigabyte? So the memory, okay, uh, the RAM, like memory. Yeah, no, but it, so yeah, you're yeah. running all on the hard disk, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so basically, what Mina is doing is sort of offload the, the stress on memory to hard drive. So yes, you're sort of correct. Uh, the amount of hard drive space needed for media is, is going to be comparable to uh, you know, what's, what's needed for, for RAM for most of the pipeline. So yeah, it's quite large. Okay. Uh, it's saving you know, a few copies of the raw movie so that mm -hmm. the, the, the algorithm can work properly. Um, I, I used to have an equation to calculate this. I can definitely post some helpful information later online. But you know, it's usually like for around four to five. I would say around four times the uh, the data, the, the mo your movie data size. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so if your movie it takes like uh, five gig, um, but it has to be the data type you choose. So because raw recording is like kind of like an eight bit format, mm -hmm. right? But usually we go we go flow point. Now, well, that would times eight. So basically, if you have five gig of video. Uh, the numerical representation of that will be kind of 40 gig. And then uh, that times four is gonna be like 160, I guess, which is quite large. Um, but on, on, in a ballpark, that's sort of what's needed on a hard drive. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so with that, that uh, go ahead and run this thing called module initializ initialization. It's, you know, initializing uh, stuff. You don't really need to worry too much about that. Um, and then the start cluster uh, block is sort of interesting because you do, uh, in practice, might want to uh, change this. Uh, so again, Minia is, is just like any other pipeline, it's using a lot of parallel process. It's called workers in this case. So each worker is a parallel process. Uh, there are two important parameters you want to change in this block. One is n workers, basically number of workers. The other is memory limit. The most important thing to remember is that the memory limit is per worker. So memory limit equals two gigabyte means every worker can only use up to two gigabyte of memory. Um, we have test uh, with a lot of data uh, with different size that two gigabyte is sort of the, the minimum uh, amount of memory needed for each worker, uh, but it's uh, usually Fine. Oh, I can actually see a raised hand. Um, do you want to go ahead, uh, Claud Claudio? Sorry. Yeah, um, I guess they just answering. So my question was like, if you miss a step, it, it will stop, will give you an error, or like, is there any way to know if you if there's any other models that have been run before you proceed on the to the next one? Uh, it will not immediately give you anything, right? Because if I skip this right now and run the same. Let's say I'm gonna do this. It's it's some. It, it all depends, uh, because you know, something like this is just printing stuff which I already defined that will not give you any error. Uh, so I guess there's no immediate way to know that. Uh, but no, you know, you can always go back and see. Okay, oh, here's an empty bracket. Uh, I never run that. So that's sort of how you know you this thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is to look at error messages, and but that requires you to, to get more familiar with the code of the notebook. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, okay, a lot of questions. Please go ahead, or maybe TA can help me uh, call people. Yes, I am. Hey. I'm just wondering if we can run uh, the cells simultaneously or we should do them one by one in order. Uh, well, you definitely want to run them in order for sure, but you can certainly do something like this. Uh, but this is not kind of um, a random simultaneously per se. It's just because the kernel can only 
do one thing at a time. Uh, you're basically kind of scheduling everything, right? You, you tell the kernel, oh, I'm going to run all of this, but take your time, do it one by one. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can definitely do it. Uh, but yes, make sure to run them in order. So we have to wait for one cell to be no, finished. No, you don't have then. to. You don't have to, the kernel is going to wait for you, right? If you if you run something that's going to take forever, I can give you a quick example. Um, if you do something like this, so you can definitely run these two in a row, and you just see start on both of them. Mm -hmm. And the kernel is just run them in sequence. Once this is done, that will be automatically run. And okay. Yeah, it's just like that. Okay. Um, so, yes. I, I think that what she meant was if you can start from cell number one and just hit like uh, run all the cells, uh, so you don't have to click like cell by cell. Yes. So you can you, run you that. can do that. Yeah, yes. you can do. Uh, you cannot. Oh, okay. Uh, it's uh, it's under cell here. You have wrong cells, which is boring. That's just wrong single cell. You can run everything below. You can. Oh, sorry. No. Uh, they run on, it's run yeah, on. Yeah, run all. It's run all the cell. You can run everything above and run everything below. Um, yeah, that's sort of the option you have, uh, other than clicking through every single one of them. But we're certainly not going to do that today because that's going to be boring for you. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Yes. So imagine that you want to choose your optimal uh, setting based on the computer that you have to go as fast as possible. Yes. So the number of workers, uh, I suppose that is based on the core of your uh, CPU, correct? Just going to talk about like right now. Uh, okay, cool. I, I, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions before, uh, before the cluster? Okay, so again, the only two things you need to worry about is memory limit and um, a number of workers. So, so uh, again, the memory limit is per worker. So two gigabytes is, is kind of a good number we test. Uh, it's, it should work for most of the data. Uh, it's probably the lowest we can push. Uh, so definitely don't want to go below two gigabytes. Uh, if you hit some sort of memory error later, uh, sell, I guess tell you sort of have to restart uh, and you can increase that a little bit. But for today, you know, we're pretty confident two gigabytes is gonna work. And then the way you set number of worker is basically, well, you sort of want to push it as much as possible, like set it as high as possible to have as much parallel process uh, running in the at the same time. Uh, but apparently, because each worker can take up to two gigabytes of memory, you want to make sure two times the number of worker you have is a reasonable amount so that you want to make sure you have that amount of memory available to you. So if I do two and like uh, like like 16, the Zorin is going to kill me because our cloud instance doesn't have 32 gigabyte of memory, right? So remember, it's two times this number. You want to make sure that amount of memory is actually available to you. Otherwise, it's going to crash. Um, so uh, as, as, sorry, I missed your name. Uh, as the participant just, just mentioned, uh, this you know also sort of relate to how many core you have. Uh, if you have like four core, and pushing it to more than four is gonna give you sort of diminishing return because you, your computer is sort of overstretched. It, it doesn't really, it cannot really do all that things in parallel. So if you push it above the core, uh, you're just gonna have sort of diminishing uh, increase in performance, but you should, but still it should be fine. As long as it's reasonable, it's not like a thousand. Uh, it's, it's still, it should be fine and you should at least still be able to run everything. Uh, uh, usually in practice, we find that the memory limit also all, almost always comes first. Like you all, you almost always have more cores to spare, but two times this number is kind of reaching the memory available for you. So, so that's sort of the rule uh, for setting these two uh, numbers. I see uh, questions. Go ahead. Yeah, it was me. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. But did you finish this? Yeah. Did you yes. finish this step? Yeah. Okay. So just one open question. What what is better to increase the memory limit 
or increase the number of workers? Increase the number of workers. So memory limit, you want to push it as low as possible. Again, two is the, the lowest we can push. Uh, as long as it doesn't crash, you don't want to increase that. You don't need to increase that. You want to keep mm -hmm. this as low as possible, then increase the number of workers as much as you can. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so for today, uh, okay, more questions, go ahead. Wow. So sorry, Phil, because I mean, it's still, uh, so imagine that you have a CPU with the eight core and you have uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM and uh, an SSD with like several terabytes. Yeah. So you're saying to not go below two gigabytes, but to actually have the number of workers more than the core that you have. You so can even, have them, but I'm not sure how much increase in performance that's gonna give you. Okay, so even if yeah. you have like a eight core, you can yeah. put uh, 16 workers. I think so. Uh, yeah, you, you, I mean, you can definitely do that in the sense it will not give you any error or crash. So, but the memory limit is referring to the RAM, is it correct? Yes. Cool, so you will actually use the 32 gigabytes of RAM out of let's yes. say 64, okay. Yes, yes. So, but I'm not getting why you, I, I understand that the number of workers, I understand the relationship with the memory limit. So I'm not getting, a, so imagine that I put less workers, but I increase the memory limit. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be better? So I'm not no. getting if it is better to increase the number of workers or increase the memory limit. Increase the number of workers. Memory limit number doesn't give you anything as long as, as you don't crash. If you can run stuff without crashing, okay. maybe be it. You don't need to increase that. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yo. Uh, more questions? Yes. Uh, I mean, this one was asked uh, in the chat by uh, Gifang, okay. but I also wanted to, I mean, I, I figure I put it up here. Because um, mm -hmm. um, there was this mention of the kill worker. Uh, the thing is, sometimes this happens uh, when you like, you know, you get basically the, like, um, you set up the memory limit, for example, too, too high and stuff for too many workers. Um, and you know the problem is sometimes I get this and it happens like mid, like mid uh, processing. And I don't mm -hmm. know is it because the software doesn't really use all the memory right away. So basically, if I set up that I've you know more than what I really have, but it will mm -hmm. like actually happen later in the processing that will it'll, it'll this, this will have an effect and crash it, or is this an error that just happens spontaneously sometimes? The kill worker error in particular. It's, yes. Yes, so the kill worker is saying the cluster, like the, so the cluster is kind of monitoring all the workers. And it's telling every single worker, okay, you can only use two gigabyte. If you're gonna try to use more than two gigabyte, I'm gonna kill you. So that's what kill worker means. It's, it means the cluster is managing the worker and the worker is asking too much and the cluster is killing it. So that all, almost always means, uh, like if you if you go to your operating system monitor, you probably see not all the memory are used, right? I assume uh, that's sort of your experience. So that's because Excellent. the cluster itself is, is monitoring them. It's kind of making sure it doesn't exceed the limit. So basically, if I do this like, if I do it like this right now, Mina will never use more than 32 gigabyte. The cluster will kill the worker before that happens. So it will probably, it can sort of make sure you will not crash your operating system by using more than 32 gigabyte of, of memory. So the kill worker basically means that. When that, well, the source of that problem is very complicated. It can, a lot of things can happen, uh, you know, because here and there like, people run stuff differently, or maybe it's actually because your data is too long. Uh, to avoid that, uh, you want to increase this limit. So, right, like you, you, the worker is asking for more. So maybe just allow it more and usually it will solve it. I think if you see that, maybe do three or four, that should almost always fix a problem. Mm -hmm. If that doesn't fix a problem, there's something seriously wrong. Cause you know, sometimes, you know, computer can, can be sporadic and it just need a tiny bit more than two. And that can be one cause of the queue worker. Uh, but if you give it three or four and still doesn't work at like, or it still crash consistently at a particular step, that's something wrong or it's even a bug. Uh, and we should definitely, you should definitely even submit an issue or like question for that. I get it. Got it. Yeah. Cool, man. Thanks. That was very helpful. Yeah. No problem. Uh, any more questions?
OK, so uh, I'm not sure whether you guys already run this, but for today, we're actually going to use four workers. Uh, the, the other kind of annoying thing about this cluster is once it start, it's sort of hard to, to kill. I don't actually know the proper uh, mechanism to kill that. So if you already run this cell like I did, um, let's just restart everything. So go to kernel, restart, and clear all the output. And uh, make sure to change this number to four and save the notebook. I'm going to save right now. And then let's just rerun all these four kind of setting up lines. So one, two, the parameter block, three, import, four, this initialization, and five, um, start a uh, cluster. Um, if you already have an existing cluster, start it up and you run this, it should kind of give you a warning saying something's running and the port is not available, blah, blah, blah. Uh, make sure you don't have that because that shouldn't happen. Um, if that happens, restart the kernel and rerun these four, uh, five lines. Okay, uh, is everyone up to speed with the setting up part? Uh, the, the, the closing remark for setting up part is that remember all these five lines has to be wrong every time you restart the kernel, like we just did. Okay, so that's uh, sort of intuitive, I guess, because it's just importing stuff, in, uh, defining stuff, starting a cluster. Of course, you want to make sure you do that every single time you have a clean, fresh kernel. Okay, so if without more questions, I'm gonna go ahead and go to actually the pre-processing step. Mm. And we make sure we set our, uh, the number of workers for here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, uh, so pre-processing, you know, the very first thing you want to do is load the data. Um, there is, um, Go ahead and run this line. This is kind of boring. It's just printing out uh, the, the parameters for loading a video. Um, let us, oops, no, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so print this. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through what this means. Pattern is the file name pattern the mina is going to look for. Right now here, this basically says it has to be, uh, the file name has to be like MS cam uh, followed by a number and dot AVI, which is sort of uh, kind of what we want, of course. Uh, I think V4 recordings doesn't have the MS cam anymore. So if you're dealing with that, just delete this from the pattern. Uh, this whole thing is a regex in case for uh, you, you're familiar with this. This is basically Python regex. You can change that to whatever that fits your file name pattern. Uh, data tab. Uh, you like unsigned integer 8, 8 bit. Uh, you almost always want to leave that be. That's sort of the native uh, data type for the raw recording. Um, the only interesting you might want to change is downsampling and downsampling strategy. Um, so, you know, in case you have, uh, you, you can, in case you, you, your data is very large, it's really hard to get the full size data to run through, or, or you just don't care about that much detail or like that high resolution. Uh, this is where you do the downsampling. So Minya do the downsampling from the very beginning and every single uh, uh, step is gonna use the downsampled data. So the way you specify that is you can downsample in any of the three dimension of the video. So either the frame dimension, time dimension, or the two spatial dimension height and width. Uh, the way you specify that is basically by an integer telling how much times you want to downsample. So if you if I want to you know downsample every other frame, I'm gonna say frame two here. If I want to do spatial downsampling, I'm gonna say uh, height and width with one. Um, let me finish with a downsample strategy and then I answer the question, Federico. Um, the uh, downsample strategy, I think, is either taking the mean or taking a subset. So, you know, like when you downsample, of course, there are different ways you can do that. You can just, let's say, if I downsample two in time, I can basically either take every other frame or I can compute some sort of mean or median of every other frame. Uh, you know, for us, usually we're just go lazy and, and do the subset, and that's the fastest operand, of course, because it's just subsetting the data. Um, 
So for today, uh, for the time sake, we are actually gonna downsample two by two on the spatial dimensions. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that I usually prefer spatial downsampling over time, because you know in the end it's the we most of us care more about the temporal activity of cells rather than the exact shape of the cell. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and downsample two and two, and I'm gonna show you how do you change parameters. So I guess I forgot to mention that almost all parameter in Minion is basically a Python dictionary, as you can see here. This is, you know, a dictionary, and to change them, you basically just say, uh, you know, you you call the key and you you change the content of that. Uh, I hope everyone is familiar with with, you know, what's a dictionary. So, if not, I'm gonna try to kind of show you uh, how to change that. So basically, you call this dictionary. Uh, the key we want to change is down sample, right? So it says down sample. And then, uh, you know, the downsample parameter itself is another dictionary like this. So I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna put it here. But you know, we're gonna do two times spatial downsampling, um, like this. So everyone, please do this uh, here right right now. And um, it's sort of important because otherwise, it will take you forever to run through today's demo. Uh, so make sure you downsample by two. If you run this cell, because we're printing after we set the values, uh, you should be able to see the, the setting being reflected in the printout. So everyone go ahead and, and, and uh, do that. Uh, Federico, what's your question? Uh, I mean, it's not, I mean, I know the answer, but I oh. just want to leave the question open. Why you would want to downsample your data if you oh. have, if you don't have any memory requirements, right? Well, if you if you don't want to wait too long, I guess, or if you just really don't care about the uh, the spatial resolution, or if you're running a cloud demo, and you want it to be fast. So it's just a question of time, right? Yeah, no, or, or again, not resources. If if it's RAM uh, that's giving you trouble, this certainly will also help. Okay, and yeah. a second thing. If what happens if my videos are not called MS cam? Like well, you change the, before the course, yeah. The before records videos are zero, one, two, three, four. Yeah, you delete this, right? Okay, so where do I delete that? Where? Yeah. Oh, I, you, I mean, you do the same. So, like you change a pattern to whatever you want, right? Just to, I mean, I, I, I know what you mean, so it was just not. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if I was good on this, make sure you run this, please. And then we'll go ahead and actually load the video. Uh, so go ahead and run this load line and also the this save minion line right here. Please run that because that's going to take maybe a while while we talk. Um, so the load line is sort of boring. It's just telling you loading 10 videos under this folder. If it doesn't find anything, it's gonna either complain or say oh, loading zero videos, whatever. Um, uh, the thing I want to mention is that uh, you see there's a, a second line here that says chunk equals get optimal chunk from the video. Uh, that's related to how minions sort of chunk the video to optimize the, or to minimize the memory demand. Um, I guess I should talk. So after this is done, we can, oh, that's done for me. Uh, let's take a look about this chunk variable. It is a dictionary telling media, you know, how to chunk uh, in each dimension. Um, this has to be held consistent across all variables. So uh, if you run everything, if you run the whole pipeline in one shot, this won't be a problem for you at all because this variable will be available. But if you, for whatever reason, you need to restart the kernel somewhere down the line, uh, this variable will be kind of lost because this variable is defined by this line, right? The, the chunk variable is defined by get optimal chunk uh, function. So you have two options. You can either, you know, make sure go here, here, run the low video and sort of run 
this uh, function again to get the same result. In theory, as long as your, your available memory is now changing dramatically, this should be consistent. Uh, that's one option you have, just rerun this, which should be quite, pretty quick. The other option is, you know, just sort of copy this down or save this variable somewhere. You can, you know, go fancy and save it to actually to a, like a Pico binary uh, uh, file. But I'm just gonna copy this down because it's a simple dictionary. I'm gonna copy this number I have right here. I'm gonna put it somewhere that I cannot miss. So how about I go back to the parameter block, you know, insert another line says the chunk variable is basically this. So that, you know, every time I go here, I, I, I define the parameter, I already have this variable defined. So I don't have to worry about rerunning the low video uh, portion of the code. So everyone, please do this. Uh, again, the, the number you sh get should be the same as me. If not, please tell me and that probably means there's some difference in our cloud instances. Um, but you know, copy down your your chunk dictionary, define that, uh, and put it put it somewhere you you cannot miss. Let's say the parameter block, and save. Okay. So with that, I don't need this anymore. Um, we see that the next line is already uh, finished. This and basically just kind of reading the video and save them into a, a numerical representation, like the chunked array format. Uh, there's not really any interesting happening here. Uh, so we just go ahead and move on to the next block. This is just uh, printing out this variable called VRR. Um, it's an X array variable. Uh, as I mentioned, it's sort of not the most popular package in Python. But the benefit of this is that in addition to, to the data itself, it kind of gives you a lot of information about the metadata. So you see the printout tell you sort of how large this array is going to take in memory, how large is each chunk, which you don't really usually don't need to worry about that much. The data tab, you in eight, that's what we said. Uh, well, more importantly, the metadata about the, the, the frame height width, the dimension coordinates. So you'll see every single frame in this array has a metadata, like uh, has an index. So right now we just set it to something boring, like uh, like an increasing uh, uh, array of integers. Uh, for the height and width, you can also you can already see something interesting because you see the numbers are jumping, and that happens because we downsample by two. So we're basically taking every other frame in your original video. So uh, I choose to do this. Um, to sort of maintain this metadata coordinates as much as possible because it's easier to correspond this back to your raw data, right? Like you don't want to sort of remember how much downsample you have done in the past, but you can rely on these coordinates to, to say which pixel this is. That's a general idea. Um, uh, the other, only other thing I want to mention is that these are only kind of, uh, these are just for reference or like for metadata only. Uh, the array itself, as you can see, is already being cut down to 304 by 304 size. And when you specify in parameters like spatial window or something like that, you need to sort of think in this size, like your input data is 304 by 304, which is already downsampled. So uh, that could be mis kind of misleading for a lot of people because one thing you have this kind of preserved coordinates, but on the other hand, for almost all the algorithms, uh, you need to sync the parameter in the downsampled size or space. Um, so that's that. Uh, that's just a printing line. Um, without questions, we are going to go into uh, the first visualization of Minion. So go ahead and run 3.2 here, and you should be able to see like a viewer like this. Um, so this is uh, the, the, the one of the first uh, visualization media has. It's just like a player for you to go through different data, uh, the, the, your raw data. This is a single frame. That's the histogram of fluorescence values in this uh, frame. Uh, I think you can do something like this to sort of kind of recolor everything based on the certain re uh, range of value you want to look at, you know, just for fun. Um, and then uh, 
you have the summary statistics. Uh, so by default, mean and compute the max fluorescent value and mean fluorescence value for every single frame and plotting them across time like this. Uh, the most useful uh, use case for this is that when you have a drop frame in recording or something weird happens, let's say your LED blow up to 100 for a few frames, something like that. Um, anything, you know, anything that will dramatically change your fluorescent value, uh, you should be able to see that here, right? If you have a dropped black frame, you should be able to see both the max and mean drop to basically zero. And this is how you sort of uh, know whether you should subset the data, right, to get rid of those bad frames. Uh, so that's the main purpose of this plot. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that, uh, let me reset this, it's getting weird. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that uh, you can define an arbitrary mask in this uh, video. Uh, and you can use that mask for whatever reason. The most common use case for the mask is to subset the data for motion correction only. And the reason is pretty clear in this particular video because you can see sort of, uh, I guess, almost a green lens uh, border in your image. And all these dark pixels uh, around the corner is not gonna move, although the brain itself will move. So if you just run motion correction on the whole video, it, it will probably bias your, your estimation of motion to something very minimal because you have a very strong feature that's not, not moving. So usually what people do or what, what we recommend doing is set use only a, a center portion of the data to do motion correction. And the easiest way to define such region or mass is in using this viewer. You can go to this uh, box edit tool here. Uh, make sure it's this kind of solid one that says box edit, not the other one. It can be confusing. You click on that and then you double click in your field of view and move your cursor around, you should see a box following your cursor. Uh, once you are happy with the region, somewhere like here, you double click to close it. And here you have a mask defined. So once you are satisfied with this, this is important, <laughs> remember to click this button called update mask. Uh, there won't be any sort of feedback, but as long as you're sure you, you click it, it's fine. You can definitely click it multiple times if you're not sure. So after that, uh, if you run the second line, which is basically kind of pulling out information from the mask and store that into this variable called subset MC. So after you do that, run the next line, let's look at the content of subset MC. And um, you should be able to see that it's a dictionary, you know, basically uh, defining a box because it's a slice on the height and width dimension with some number. So uh, please go ahead and draw a box like this right now, you know, something that's kind of cover your, your field of view. Uh, remember to click update mask and then run the next line and it's sort of confirm the content of subset MC. Phil, can I yes. add that? to click and select, you have to uh, press shift too. It's shift I think double click. click works too, or shift, I, oh. I couldn't remember, yeah. Okay, so if everyone was able to do this, uh, again, uh, it's quite important for this, uh, to make sure we only use this for motion correction and not the whole video. Uh, and I don't really want to draw this box every single time. It's quite annoying uh, in case I, I need to restart kernel. So I'm gonna go ahead and actually save the content of this variable to be used later. So please do the same as me, you know, just kind of copy this, copy, and let's scroll all the way back or actually use the, use the table of content go to the block of uh, parameter block and let's go here. Let's add another line called subset MC equals the thing. I just copied. I'm gonna make them look prettier like this. So everyone please do this so that, you know, we make sure in case we need to restart a kernel, uh, all of this stuff are defined. You know, this is some sort of trick or you can always do so that you don't you don't lose anything. 
I see a question. Go ahead. Yeah, so just to confirm, because it's subset MC is, is defined right at the beginning on like line six or so of the setting yes. up. Yes. So that's, that's, I can also just use that one, right? It's the same, if, yes, I'm not, exactly. if I got it correct. Okay, cool. You're talking about here, right here, right? Oh, wait, then it's defined twice because there's also above yes. even. Uh, so if you go even oh, farther. Oh, sorry. Up. Oh, yeah. okay. I'm going to okay. fix that. Get rid of that. Okay, but in they're case, all the yeah. same and stuff. Yeah, they're all okay, the same. Cool. Yeah. And, you know, when you're just redefining stuff in Python, they'll just overwrite sort of. So here, I guess, this is the end. That's the safest place. Uh, but you can also definitely just modify this. Awesome. No, and yeah. thank you for pointing this out and whatnot. And this is something that I might ask also later the same is because yeah. I'm super interested in batch processing, right? And yes. it, this is exactly the kind of stuff I would need. Uh, so yeah. awesome, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked this because I, I guess I forgot to mention like the, I guess there are two way of changing parameters in Minion. They are just, they're basically the same, but it's just depending on where you change them. Uh, you know, the reason we put all the parameter here in a single block at the very beginning, is because we want some sort of some sort of batch processing, right? Like if you go back to your notebook and you want to remember what did I do, you only need to look at this block only. You don't need to scroll all the way down and find them. Uh, so that's why we kind of put everything here. And you know, when you want to change stuff, you can either do the thing I have been showing you, which is basically insert a random cell and run the code to change them, or you can actually go back all the way here and actually just change it here you know, to something to, to make it more explicit and, you know, so that everything is defined only once. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of the two things you can usually do. If you're like me and you don't like, you know, uh, having places like where it's defined up at the top and then it's defined at the bottom, you know, you just delete it from here and put it down below, you know, if you're doing like your individual processing and you don't want to, and you just want to make sure you explicitly define it right before you're running it. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. So uh, it's a good point just to like the whole notebook is like kind of a template and you can change it however you want to suit your needs. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's all some practical tip we usually do. Um, so okay, so yeah, go ahead. So because it, I noticed it here. So if you look at check, um, you know, the, the dimensions are 250, 38, 38. Yep. And then when you go down to the, the visualization of, of there. Um, oh yeah, that's that's can be confusing. Where is that? Damn, I couldn't even find it. I've been meaning to ask you about this. So yeah. So if you go there, yes. you know, the shape of the chunk is listed. It's different. So which one, like what, what's the difference between those two things? Yes. The difference is uh, the chunk variable, chk variable, defines what size you should use if you want to chunk that dimension. But in Minion, you know, depending on which step it is, we sometimes, we almost always only want to either chunk the time dimension or the spatial dimension. And in this particular case, for preprocessing, we always always want to chunk the time dimension. That's why time dimension is same. It is correct, 250. But the other two is actually not chunked. That's the difference. Later, when you have variables that need to be chunked in spatial dimension, you should be able to see the correct 38 uh, size. Uh, I see. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. OK, if there are no more questions, again, let me, OK, one more question. Go ahead. So I actually never got to this right, this thing of the mask for the for the motion correction. So I'm very happy now to finally get it. And just uh, curious. So in case anybody has like some issues on the videos, so there is a part of the video that you want to take out. Mm -hmm. the, the way that I'm doing now is that I'm actually slicing the, the video actually before this. Mm -hmm. With uh, so another line of code that I inserted by myself, I actually go to operate on the var variable, mm -hmm. and I have a var dot uh, sel, and then I slice by the coordinates that I want. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's the correct way or if there is any. It is. 
That's okay, cool. actually so the most correct um, way. Uh, you're gonna see that right now, I think. Uh, you know, we just go through this. Actually, the next immediate next part you say is subset parallel video. Uh, the example we always gave is you know to take out dropped frames, but basically subsetting is arbitrary dimension. You can certainly subset spatially, right? You slice out a portion of the field of view and you basically do the same. Actually, here, here's an example. It says we are dot select height equals slice something, right? Yes. Yeah, I so think that's what you're asking. So the point that I don't get is this. If you're going to cut out uh, a part of the, the video so that uh, so we don't like it because it's all black or whatever the reason. So mm -hmm. why don't we subset actually the video before the motion correction? Oh, because, uh, uh, hold on, this is before motion correction. We are not, we're only defining a mask for motion correction. We're not doing that yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my question is that, so we, when, when you select that mask, you're actually taking out parts of your recordings that uh, you- No, we're not. I need to, subset MC is now actually used here at, at all. This is only a variable that's defined. Um, subset is used to take out uh, part of the video, and uh, we didn't do anything to subset. It's it's, it's yeah. still now. Okay, but the subset MC is going to be used for the motion correction, okay? Because it's like yes. the best part of your video. Yes. Okay, and then you have the this other subset that is actually to take out the parts of the video that will not yes. be analyzed at all. Yes. So my question is that, would it not better to actually subset the video before mm -hmm. uh, setting this mask for the motion correction and then just get all of these video for the motion correction without having to set this mask. Well, you can certainly do that, yes. Okay, you can leave cool, subset cool. MC to empty and just do this. The only difference is that subset MC will only be used for motion correction. Like, let's say we do this. Uh, in the end, you still get the full data from here. We're okay. only using this part for motion question. You won't lose anything. But if you're doing subset, they'll be gone. Like in all the, almost yeah, all the yeah, variable yeah. later, they'll just not exist. So that's the main difference. So actually, I and you can do question. both. So is there a way to actually get a, because this is a square, but most of our lenses are actually circular. Is there a yeah. way to actually get a circular mask? That's hard because you know, everything is based on array and matrix. If you think about it, it's really hard to have a circular matrix, right? <laughs> to do the CMF or yeah, no. stuff. Yeah, I mean, I would like not a number in all of these cases. Uh, or... Right now, I think some algorithm will really stress about a uh, non value. Um, so yeah, right now it, it's not really supported. Um, maybe and, I can try to achieve that later. And final question. So is there any indication on the percentage of uh, the, the field of view that you have to select for the motion correction? Like in this case, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's from 100 to 500. So it's like, uh, I don't know, three fourth of your, uh, so is there any indication how much of it should you select? Um, so we're gonna sort of see them later because uh, oh, the data cool. that feed in, I, I'll answer, I'll quickly answer right now. The data we feed into motion correction is really clean uh, almost only consists of, of cells. Uh, if you don't have any cell firing, the motion correction can, can have a trouble kind of finding the correct motion. So given that, uh, you basically want to use as much as po data possible. You know, you basically want to include as much cell as possible because they are actually going to be the landmark for motion correction. Uh, so basically, yeah, something like this. Do as okay. much as possible uh, as long as you don't include anything that's kind of stable, like a background. Yeah. Yeah. So, but imagine that you have actually another type of landmark, like a blood vessel, that is a bit far from the from the cells. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, what is better to select the the region of interest with the cells, or mm -hmm. the region of interest with the blood vessel? I, so, I would say, if possible, do both, right? But okay, yeah. if you only but choose if, one, uh, I but think. If it work? Yeah, yeah, but I, I guess the blood vessel will be better. Like that's the common sort of, uh, 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 that's the most intuitive part. But the only thing is that you have to make sure the blood vessel is still there after pre-processing. Cause pre-processing usually get rid of that easily. Uh, mm. 
So, you know, unless your feature is, can, can, can be kind of bright or like still there after pre-processing, uh, then I would say go with the cells. The okay. other option, you know, if you really like the block vessel is to motion question before pre-processing. That will require you to sort of move some of these cells around, right? You want to do motion question before subtracting the backgrounds. So that's the other option. Um, but that's just, you know, not the default flow of the pipeline. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions or? Okay, I'm gonna can delete I, this. Wait, can, can I ask you one yeah. more question? Yeah. If you have a, if you have a, a, blood, a big blood vessel that is pulsating yeah. in the middle of the, let's say it's either in the middle or on one side of the, or your video, yeah. what would you do in that case? Uh, I mean, in theory, the, the uh, background removal should get rid of that. Okay, but now in this step of, now in this step of like, subs, like uh, selecting a mask, it's, uh, would you avoid the bad vessel or would you just try to select it? I guess you have to kind of try different stuff. Like you sort of have to run it and maybe, you know, which as a result of pre-processing to see whether it's still there. You know, if it's still there, you need probably need to go back and redefine the mask to avoid it. If it's gone, it's probably fine. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and do this subset. Uh, again, the one of the main use for this is to take out drop frames. We just confirmed with the visualization that our video is good and there's no weird frames in our recording. Uh, so subset is actually kind of like a noun right here. Uh, it's close to a noun. So we're not subsetting anything, but we do need to kind of run this to, to have this defined. That's just kind of the convention. Uh, and then we are actually going to move into the very first real computation of Minion. Uh, hopefully things will speed up. Um, glow removal. So go ahead and run this two cell. And then, oops, that was fast. So here is what sort of glow removal uh, does. Uh, glow is a lame word I chose at some point. It's really kind of removing the vignetting effect you can see. Uh, so in the visualization, you know, we have this side-by-side -side viewer and you can go through different frames again to see uh, what the glow removal is doing. On the right is the original, on the left is the removed uh, image. And you can see the effect is that of that is basically it removed this kind of we need an effect where the center of the field of view is always brighter than the surrounding, uh, so that you know everything is more evenly distributed across. Um, the way we do that is basically compute a minimum projection across the whole video, and just subtract that to from every single frame. So it's kind of an operation that's parameter free. Uh, usually, you just want to run it and confirm everything is working properly, uh, and keep going. So. If there are no questions, we're gonna go move on to uh, denoise. Okay, denoise. Uh, as we mentioned, the default uh, thing we do for denoise is do a median filter. That's what the method means. And then the only parameter you need to worry is the kernel size. Uh, by default, it's seven. But you know, uh, it's always good to use a visualization to check. So the next cell will give you the visualization. But before we actually run that, I want to show you um, uh, what if you want to try more values. So right now, the default for visualization is five, seven, and nine. So basically, uh, the code will run through uh, the processing, or basically run through the processing on one frame with the kernel size five, seven, and nine, and show the result interactively. But what if you want to uh, see something more, like you want to go beyond this range, or actually in some other cases, you want to kind of go more fine-grained uh, uh, tweaking the numbers. So let's go ahead and add in more numbers here. Um, let's do add a three to this list. And just to show you what happens if you go crazy on the median filter, let's add a large number 21 to the kernel size. So add this to, you to, to your notebook and run it. It should take a few seconds and you get something like this. Um, 
So again, uh, as you heard yesterday, this is uh, we're just plotting the image before and after the filter and the contour plot before and after the filter. If you scroll in, you know, you can sort of get a closer look at these cells. Um, right here, we're using a kernel size of three. And again, uh, this can give you some sort of uh, problem in the sense that um, you still have a, a little bit of this kind of tiny island uh, left here and there. So. In some sense, the noise is not completely removed, right? So if you go back higher at five or, or maybe seven, you can see that you know most of the, the noise are sort of removed, especially from you can see that clearly from the comfort plot, like uh, the 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 whole field will become much more cleaner. Uh, but let's see what happens if you go crazy on 21, you know. Well, that's that's a really extreme example, I guess. Uh, you get something like this, like they already blurred, and you some sort of have these cartoonish frames. I guess even I uh, can give you problems because you know if you look at these two cells, they used to be sort of well defined, but right, but after a media field of nine, they 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 beginning to connect with each other. Um, so that's one thing you want to definitely avoid. Uh, here's another example. Uh, they used to be well defined, but right now they're, they're sort of dimmed and kind of uh, become a one big blob. Um, so that's uh, sort of the thing you usually look for in this step uh, for median filter. Again, uh, you want to choose something in the middle. I'm going to say five is a good choice. Looks like a good choice for me. It's a good compromise between. Uh, you know, not over smoothing everything and getting rid of the noise as much as possible. Um, and if you remember, the default parameter was seven. So let's make sure we change that. So param denoise uh, case size equals five. And let's print out uh, to make sure it's actually in effect. Okay, so median and kernel size are five. Make sure you change it by you know run this, either run this or change it somewhere else. And then make sure after you do that, you do this uh, denoise function to actually carry out the denoising. Um, so if I run, it's able to do this. Let's go uh, do, let's move on to background removal. Um, let me make sure I said everything I want to say. Uh, background removal. Um, well, first of all, we start by printing the parameter again. Uh, uh, method is top hat. That's basically another name for the morphological option operation we're using. You you almost always want to leave it be. And then the only other, the only other parameter you want to play with is the window size uh, of this morphological operation. So again, we have the visualization. And again, I want to throw in some crazy numbers to show you the effect. Let us throw in uh, three and five. Oh, I guess I already have five here. Um, so let us do three. Let, let's just add three in the list. And the other thing I want to change is uh, uh, make sure we are using another frame, frame a thousand. So here is where you change uh, which frame we're going to use for this visualization? If you, I think by default it was zero, uh, but you know, let's go ahead and use frame one thousand just for for the fun. Uh, so make sure this a thousand here is three, five, ten, fifteen here, and go ahead and run it. Uh, okay, so we have the same idea again. Um, so let's go in to look at a few cells. Um, Okay, so here is what you get when you use a window size of three for this morphological operation. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, the problem with doing too small is that it can sort of artificially reduce the size of cell. I guess here is a good example. This cell used to kind of span this whole space here, uh, but, but after a, a window of three, it's kind of being artificially shrinked. Uh, into this tiny little uh, smaller thing. Uh, 
because we are spatially downsampled, this actually doesn't happen that much. Uh, like three is, is the lowest number you can go, and it seems okay for this video again because everything is already spatially downsampled, and three is actually sort of appropriate. Um, and then again, if you go larger and larger, if you go something like 15, the problem with that is you see that it's now removing all the background. For example, I'm not sure whether you can see here, there's a little bit of shade down here that's, uh, it, that exists in the original video, but still exists after the background removal. So that's something you sort of want to don't want, uh, you want to avoid because you know, the step of this is to remove the background and get it as clean as possible. Uh, if your screen is good, uh, good enough, you, you can also see a tiny bit of shade here. That's definitely not something we want to keep in our video. So that's what happens when you have a, have a large enough window size. And for this step, I'm gonna say again, five looks good to me. It didn't shrink anything, right? Like this guy still looks like what used to be in the video. Uh, and I don't have any weird background or like I get rid of them as much as possible. And let's use a window size of five. Let's make sure we change that. So parameter background removal window equals five. And let's print it out to make sure that is correct. And then go ahead and run the next step. It should sort of finish immediately. And then we're gonna run 3.7 save result, the most exciting step because it's gonna take a while. Uh, make sure you run this and I'm ready to answer any question. I think I saw a question before. Any questions? What? I would, did I hallucinate? And I saw, I saw a question. Uh, I had a question um, regarding the drop frames. What, what do I do if I notice that there are black or distorted frames? somewhere here and there. Yeah, okay, let me demo that. Let's say, let's say, uh, in theory, you should be able to see that here, right? Let's say on frame 6,000, something weird apparently happened, you're right? You, like you either see clear, clearly in the video or you can quickly see that in the summary, uh, you know, uh, fluorescent, that's kind of, there's a dip somewhere, right? Let's say that happens. Um, we are gonna uh, use a subset variable. Uh, wow, I guess I'm, I'm, it has been too long. I forgot how to take out a single frame with slice. Okay, I'm gonna do something convoluted unless any TA have a good idea. <laughs> it's been so long since I do well, this. Does it only take slices or it will also take a range of frame, frame numbers? So you it will also the take the range of frame number. Yeah, so we I can mean, definitely do that. Maybe just do that for the, I mean, that might be the easiest way for, especially if you wanna define a rule of like, if you have dropped frames that are black, you could say, oh, yes. you think below you yeah. know, this intensity we're going to yeah. drop. Yeah. Okay, that's probably the easiest way we can do it. Uh, so let's there's, try to do that. There's also an X-ray function called drop cell um, that I guess does the opposite. It'll, rather than including everything that's within it, it'll drop specifically those things. Like this? It's oh, the second this? one. Wow, yeah. I, never, I never use this. <laughs> Me neither, I just Googled it. Oh, let's see, that's exciting. <laughs> What's this? Oh, I think it works. Let's drop the first frame. Oh, it's actually gone, wow. Okay, okay, I guess in theory, the most correct answer for that is this. Can I do? Can I do this? No. Can I do? 
Okay, do this. I can certainly do this. Okay, so I guess you can do drop select, then frame, like if you are dropping frame, frame equals the number, the frame index you want to drop, right? Um, I guess that's easy. Uh, because it's, it's the first. August, it's, it's, it's not in place, uh, which might bring rage later. Like you I'm actually sorry, have to re-overwrite the variable. Yeah. Right, right. It's not in place. Yeah, I have to. Uh, because we are not doing that for today. Yeah, no, yeah. no, of course, just saying, yeah. like, this has brought me screaming in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I guess, I guess the optimal answer for this is like this, uh, but, you know, in case this function doesn't really do what I thought it does, because it's the first time I use it, uh, the, the kind of convoluted way to do this is that maybe you define an index. Uh, like I think we have 10,000 frames. And then, uh, uh, I guess we can sort of take them out. Or oh, actually, I guess the best way to do this is to do Boolean masking. So you have a bunch of, uh, is this size? Uh, so this will create a Boolean array, I think. Of uh, of size ten thousand, yeah, and then you sort of set it uh, set something to false, and then you use this to index uh, your frame. That would be sort of equivalent. Uh, this is kind of the the old convoluted way we were thinking of. Um, does that answer the question? Yes, yes. Perfect. So I, at least you have two ways. In case one of them doesn't work. OK, any more questions? Of course. May I ask one question about the background removal? So the glue, uh, uh, what was that? The, this one? Uh, no, sorry, actually before. So when you actually remove the glow of the image. Oh, this one. Yes. So this is uh, completely automate, uh, I mean, automatic. Yes. There is no parameter. So no. I had a few cases in which I cannot have the same picture like there, where you actually, so you have these very dark, probably because the signal to noise ratio is less. So mm -hmm. what, but I still have a lot of glow that is kept in the glow removed image. Okay, so let me explain what he's doing again. So what glow remover is doing is really simple. It's compute the minimum value for each pixel, right? That's where I mean. It's basically subtracting that from every single frame of the video. Mm -hmm. So if you think, uh, I assume your question is that it seems the glow removal is not really doing anything for you still have the glow, right? Yes, so... That means you probably have some frame that's kind of dark, and that frame is sort of become this minimum value. And it's not, you're basically subtracting zero from everything. Um, that's my guess. Okay. So maybe you have some sort of fluctuation during your recording, like one or two frames become really dark, and those two frames will actually become the kind of the minimum projection of your whole video, and you're basically subtracting dark frames. Yeah, but if I look at the previous uh, graph, the one, the one where we have the max and mean, I don't see huge changes. OK. Um, so I mean, one possibility is that I actually am probably using too much light, so I'm saturating. The... Oh. Is that uh, one possibility? I mean, I, I mean, if you like ratio, but I'm just wondering if, in case one uses too much light, then you you then expect to see not this situation like you have there, where I mean, pretty mm. much everything is dark apart from the sense. On top of my head, I don't think that should happen in theory, but it could happen. Um, I sort of basically have to see the data maybe to say anything about that. Um, I don't know whether I have you upload 
that part of data, maybe you can show that later to a team. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So, but again, my question is that, so we have these uh, circular uh, lenses. Yeah. So the result is dark in the in the corners, and then, then is is actually used for the, the glue removal, the glue removal. Uh, yeah, the glue removal kind of compute the minimum projection across the whole field of view. Okay, so but it's, it's not a, like a single minimum value. It's a minimum projection. Let me actually show you. So this is what's being subtracted from uh from all the frames. That's ugly. Okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there's so many stuff to make this look pretty. We do. Oh, frame height. This is what's being subtracted from the from the. This is basically the, the glow being subtracted. So oh, I guess so what can... you can do. So I can yes. actually Plot do this. that and check. Okay, great. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, I think we were here. Hopefully, everyone uh, is run to this step. The only quick thing I want to say about this is that you probably noticed in the actual function when we do the remove background and denoise, they sort of finish immediately. That's because, again, Mini and try to not really do the computation in memory, but only create plans for them and just carry them out uh, from hard drive to hard drive. That's why almost all the computation, like when it takes time, it usually takes time at the actual safe part because that's kind of writing stuff to the hard drive. Um, that's the only thing I want to say. That's in case you are getting confused why something's finished immediately, but why it takes so long for saving. Um, that's because the computation actually happens here. Um, with that, I think we are ready for the first breakout. In case you know, you were is, is everyone able to follow along? I want to sort of get a sense of how, of how well I'm doing this. You're, you're doing great. Oh, thanks. I, I but like I want to know what's the reason, like how many participants actually are able to to get what I see right now. Like any comments? Like am I going too fast? I mean, again, talking just for myself. No, I think it's fun, dude. Like it's okay. been it's been pretty smooth sailing, I think, and also just you know, pretty chill discussion with the questions and stuff. So no, it's, so far so Thank good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad. Um, all right, I think we are ready for our first breakout. Uh, I'm not sure what's been determined about the room assignment. I think we we need to move people slightly around because we have updated participants. Uh, but in any case, let's aim to resume at 1245. You have slightly less than 15 minutes to, to clear any remaining questions.